Why is Easter good news? He has risen just as he said. Seven words which change everything forever. Seven of the most important words ever spoken. Seven words which have transformed my life. He has risen just as he said. Jesus didn't just live and die. He died and lives. And today we celebrate the truth that Jesus has defeated death so he can offer to us eternal to life. It really happened. It's not just an inspiring story or a nice idea. He has risen. And people often ask me, why do you believe? Why do you believe in Jesus? Why do you believe he rose from the dead? And these seven words sum up why I believe. He is risen, just as he said. I believe because of the evidence of Jesus' resurrection and my experience of the truth of his words. They compel me to believe. I worked as a criminal barrister for seven years, and every day for years, I was weighing evidence, assessing eyewitness evidence about events. Who's telling the truth? Who's not telling the truth? Who's who's kind of conspiring? Who's, Who's making things up? And when I read the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' resurrection, I realized that these are true. Why? Three quick reasons. Whether you've been in church for 30 years or 30 minutes, whether you're eight months old or 80 years old, three quick reasons I want to give you. So wherever you are this week, whatever you're doing, you can remember there are at least three reasons why you can have confidence that Jesus rose from the dead. But I'm going to need your help. So are you up for a bit of audience participation? Yeah. This Great. So happy to use your voices? Are you happy to use your hands? Okay, amazing. So um, the first reason... I believe Jesus rose from the dead is that Jesus was absent from the tomb. Let's say that together. Jesus was absent from the tomb. Jesus was absent from the tomb on Easter Day. And if you prefer, kind of your kinetic learner, this is how we're going to do it. Jesus, let's do it together. Jesus was absent from the tomb. You're going to imagine yourself looking through the tomb in your hands. Just look. Can you see him in there? He's not in there. So he's absent from the tomb. Try that again together, all together. Jesus. Is absent from the tomb. Amazing. I didn't, I, you're all doing it. The tomb was sealed on the order of Pilate. It was guarded by Roman soldiers. There was no way in. And there was no motive for anyone to go in. The Roman authorities, the religious authorities, they wanted Jesus to stay dead. They wanted to prove he was dead. They wanted to keep his body in the tomb. The disciples were scattered and afraid and in fear of their lives. Robbers couldn't come near it. And the only things of value in the tomb were left there after Jesus had left. But Jesus had left. He had gone. Jesus was not in the tomb. (laughs) Second reason, Jesus was with people. Let's say it. Jesus was with people. Okay, so we're going to do this is um, Jesus again, and then with people like that. So imagine they're the people and then they come together. Fantastic. (laughs) Jesus was with people. Jesus rose from the dead and he spent time with people. People saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. He appeared on 11 separate occasions. Let's do that. 11. That's quite hard to do. You have to be very quick. (laughs) 11 separate occasions. (laughs) On one occasion, to more than 500 people, there are at least 500 people, probably more than that in this building today. Let's all put your hands up. 500 people. (laughs) I tell you, I've never done a case in all my life with 500 eyewitnesses. Never done a case with that many eyewitnesses. Normally, once you get past 20 or 30 eyewitnesses, people, it's just, it's obvious. It happened. You don't need any more than that. 500 people saw him. They ate with him. And when they saw him, he still bore the marks of his cross. It was Jesus. Jesus was present with people. Fantastic. Third reason, seeing Jesus changed people. Let's say this. Now, this is a little bit more complicated. You're going to have to bear with me. Seeing Jesus, binoculars, seeing Jesus, seeing Jesus, and then praise hands, change people. Amazing. 
Seeing Jesus change people. Look at the immediate impact. Jesus' followers were afraid. They were fearful. They were in hiding. And then three days after Jesus died, something happened, which meant they were desperate to go around and to tell everyone Jesus is alive. They wanted to speak boldly before crowds and governors and courts. They said when they were on trial for their lives at risk of imprisonment and death, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Jesus Seeing Jesus change people. One more time. Seeing Jesus change people. Amazing. And he's still transforming lives today. We just heard of people who, this is their first Easter Sunday knowing Jesus. It's amazing. People who are worshiping in this building today and with us online who this is their first Easter Sunday, who have come to faith in the last few months right here and now... They can worship Jesus, the risen Jesus, on Easter day. He is still transforming lives today. And when you place your trust in Jesus, resurrection life is what you experience. Resurrection is not just good news about an event. It's an encounter with a person. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And when you encounter him, when we place our trust in him, we experience life and life in all its fullness. And that's what I found. I thought it might be costly to place my trust in Jesus. So I have to give up lots of things I enjoy. But what I found is that what he says is true. The richest, most satisfying, most joyful life is the resurrection life Jesus brings. That's the best life you can ever lead. And you can have confidence that Jesus is who he says he is. That he said he came to die for our sins and rise after three days. It matters Jesus is who he says he is. And it matters he did what he said he'd do. And the fact he did what he said he'd do demonstrates who he is. When I started working as a barrister, I was just 23 years old, and I looked about 16, and so you'd turn up at court, and it was fine if you're in the Crown Court, because you wore a wig and you wore a gown, and it proved you're a barrister. But in the magistrate's court, you just wore a suit, and I looked like a work experience student, and you'd go, and you'd <laughs> represent these very experienced, uh, not criminals, but people accused of crimes, and, uh, and once I turned up, very last minute, uh, and I met my client, And he looked at me, and it was instantly obvious to me he was far more experienced in the criminal justice system than I was. And and his first question was, how old are you? That's not a good first question when you meet your client. And I said, well, you know, I'm older than I look. (laughs) Uh, And then he said, well, how long have you trained for? And I was thinking, this is really not going well. I mean, if you have to prove your qualifications to your client, that's never a good way to start. And I said, well, we don't have time to talk about that. We're just about to go into court. Just to say, the evidence is really strong. It's going to be very difficult. I'll do what I can. There's one tiny flaw in the prosecution case. I'll see what I can do, but I can't make any promises. He was like, he looked completely unconvinced by me, by my age, by my experience, my, by my abilities, my qualifications. I went into court. I, I was, the judge was about to come in. I turned around and looked at him. He was still unhappy. And uh, the judge came in. He sat down. He looked at me. He said, Mr. Foster, do you represent the defendant? I said, yes. He said, it seems to me that there's a flaw in the prosecution case. Uh, And I said, yes. And he said, so I think I should dismiss the prosecution case and acquit your client. Do you agree? I said, yes. (laughs) And he said, that's what I'm going to do. And he dismissed the prosecution case. I acquitted my client. I'd said three words. I turned around, looked at my client. He was like... We got outside the court, he came up to me, he said, you're a great barrister, you're a brilliant barrister, you're so good at what you do. I said, thank you. I mean, I'd literally said yes three times. Then he shook my hand as hard as ever, anyone has ever shook my hand. He leaned in quietly and he said, are you free next week? I've got a few more cases I might need your <laughs> help with. And I, I mean, it mattered I said I was a barrister, but I think he was more persuaded when I did what I said I was going to do. If you go in for an operation and the surgeon comes in, they say they're a surgeon. It matters they say they're a surgeon. But when you wake up after the operation and the operation has gone well, you've got confidence, you've got trust, you're sure they're a surgeon. When you get on a plane and the pilot says it's your pilot speaking, you think they're a pilot, but when you land safely at their destination, you know they're a pilot. You think they've got me there safely. It matters Jesus is who he says he is because he, he did what he said he would do, and that means you can trust him. He said, I'm the son of God. I'm going to die for your sins. I'm going to rise again. And the fact he did it proves who he is. And that means that the son of God loves you and gave himself for you. 
And that means you can be forgiven today, restored today. You can experience today resurrection life. And you can have resurrection hope. I don't know how you're doing today. I don't know if you had a wonderful two years or a really difficult two years. I don't know if you're full of joy or you're full of fear. I don't know if you're worried about the next stage or at a crossroads in your life, you're trying to take a big decision, or whether you're full of joy and purpose. Or maybe like me, it's a bit of a mix. And you're trying to work things out. I don't know if you're excited about the terms of come at university or school or excited about what's happening in your job at the moment or your family or your friendship or your hospital or your business or you're a little bit nervous. But I do know that if you have encountered Jesus Christ, his resurrection life lives in you. The Spirit of God, the Spirit who raised Jesus from death to life lives in you. And that means that on your worst day and on your best day, you have resurrection hope. God isn't finished with you yet. Your failures can be turned for good. Your good things can never be lost. And God has a purpose for your future because Jesus rose. We too will rise. And he promises to take us, those who know him, through death and into eternal life. And that means your life can have purpose and meaning. That means you can have an eternal impact every day of your life, wherever you are. That means your future is secure. That means death is defeated. That means Jesus has run. He has risen. And you too will rise. And that means that you have hope that the final word over your life is not spoken by anyone else, but only by Jesus Christ. Someone might have said something unkind to you in the last week, the last month, the last year. The final word over your life is not spoken by anyone else, but by Jesus Christ. Jesus, who turns fear into peace, who turns despair into hope, who turns weakness into strength, who turns brokenness into beauty, who turns disgrace into vindication, who turns wounds into marks of glory, who turns death into life. Jesus Christ, the righteous, my Lord, our Savior, he is the exalted Lord. He is the risen King, and he is risen just as he said. In Jesus' name, amen.